Hi, this is Paul. Last night I was watching the Rebel Wisdom guys do their question and answer, which was really a lot of fun. And one of the questions came up about the resurrection and the, uh, let's, let's call it the physicality, the histor, the, the historical resurrection, whether, whether Thomas touched Jesus' flesh and, and what this Jesus was. Now, now there, there is a deep mystery to this entire story. But in my opinion, none of this mystery in any way displaces. In fact, to me, it only encourages the physical nature of the resurrection. And so I wanted to talk about it because I think it's the, the resurrection isn't. There is a and this gets interesting because Ali, I know, wants to talk about Gnosticism and 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 I'd love to have a conversation with him at some point about Gnosticism and, and, and what that means, because I think in many ways the, the American evangelical church is very Gnostic in, in that it doesn't appreciate the importance of embodiment. Um, Jamie Smith makes a comment sometimes that, you know, the Protestant religion is, is brains on sticks. And, and I think that's a, that's a fair criticism in many ways. And so let's, let's, oh, come on, thing, work. There we go. Let, let's talk about, let's talk about the resurrection. I make a few points and a few more points along the way. Uh, number one, the resurrection is proof of lordship. Now, this aspect is, is the one most commonly given today. Jesus, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Make disciples of every nation. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that the resurrection is the basis for Jesus' claims of authority over everything in the world. Now, again, people will sometimes say, well, I don't know, I can't believe in the virgin birth. And I think, well, virgin birth? Try believing in this thing. Try, try believing that Jesus is Lord and, and, and Jesus reigns. These were if you read N.T. Wright's wonderful biography of Paul, N.T. Wright so nicely articulates how the claims of the new Christian church were heard in the Roman Empire as competing claims against the imperial claims. Uh, this is this is in some ways such an insane claim, and you can read C.S. Lewis's Trilemma. That's in Mere Christianity. That you want to say Jesus is a Jesus is a wonderful human teacher, but wonderful teachers don't make claims like this. And so people like Bart Ehrman try to get out of it by saying, "Well, Jesus didn't really claim this. This is just what his disciples claimed about him." Well, how on earth do you know Jesus didn't claim it? Were you there to see it? It's these these historical arguments usually work both ways. And I think part of the reason that you can, one way you can understand this claim is the centrality of the threat of death for human society. Paul in Romans 13 says the state has been given the power of the sword. And this in many ways sets up, if you, if you haven't watched the Tom Holland the Tom Holland N.T. Wright conversation on unbelievable. Now oh, my dog's sneezing on my video. If you haven't watched the Tom Holland N.T. Wright conversation on unbelievable, do so. That that conversation is just a masterpiece. It's just an education of laying out the facts in terms of the contributions of Paul for our culture and the radical nature of Paul's letters and how they changed the world, how they were a death charge. Because the, the threat of death is central to any kind of tyranny or governmental authority. They, the government will take your life little by little via time in, incarcer in incarceration, or they will take your life via execution. The threat of death motivates almost everything in this world. This is how this, this is how governments can, this is how governments and thieves and bullies can get people to do what they want and watch any movie. It's the threat of death. Well, maybe you can rise above the threat of your own death, but you're not going to rise above the, the death of Lois Lane or, or Superman's mom or, or some beloved person. So this is, this is the, the threat of death. And in, I don't remember whose play it was that, that imagined Herod hearing about Jesus' resurrection being so ticked off because how dare someone rise from the dead because that simply unseats the power of Eddie, of every petty tyrant and every government. 
And if you understand the connection between the resurrection and authority on earth, it makes perfect sense because all governmental authority is based on the threat of coercion. Um, we even say in our situation since Thomas Hobbes, this is that the government is supposed to have a monopoly on violence. It is the threat of coercion that gives the government power. Now, Jesus comes and is in his resurrection, all authorities in the world now have lost their power. And this was played out. This was embodied. Now, this is part of my point about this whole video that you say, well, it's a symbol, but Let's imagine that it was just a story that Christians gave their lives for the people of the plague in order to try to rescue them, or at least have them be more comfortable on their way out of the door. Christians gave their lives. The giving of a life is far more significant than the imagined giving of a life. The reality of what we do in our bodies is more than the imagination of what we do in our minds. This is where I get into my layers of reality or levels of reality or hierarchies of reality, where obviously that which we embody is more real than that which we imagine, than that which we symbolize or represent. In some ways, the embodiment of our ideas is the, is the, the greatest representation that we can do. Now, it doesn't necessarily scale, and this is where this, con this conversation gets so complex. But when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, he is challenging every governmental authority, is it challenging every ruler, because he says, all of you work by threat and coercion. Either you steal our time by minutes, or you take our life by the sword, or by the or by execution. And Jesus comes and says, I am now undermined all of that authority with my resurrection. And in my resurrection, in my resurrected flesh, I prove that governments now are all secondary to me. All authority has been given to me. I don't know why my buttons don't work. Here we go. That now often this is this is heard and used by Christians as kind of a tribal religious claim. This proves Christianity, and it does, but but it's often used apologetic, apologetically as a way to persuade people into the faith, and it does work this way. But such attempts at coercion are often resented by people, and this is part of the reason modernistic apologetics. I think they have their place. I think their place more often help strengthen believers in their faith than, in my experience, uh, turn unbelievers into Christian. And I think it's the nature of coercion that's problematic in it. And I think Peterson is right when he talks about the, vol the power of the voluntary. Uh, uh, oh, here comes an airplane. Uh, we 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 should come to him voluntarily we should we should want to come to him and and for the most part that's when people believe people usually start believing because they first want to believe and then they find justification for their beliefs that's the the elephant believing first and then the rider finally coming along and admitting that the elephant believes and makes up story to make makes him makes up stories to make him look better in front of the the other riders um but it can be a reduction which obs this this approach to the resurrection can be an, a reduction which obscures the full meaning um secular skepticism sometimes makes it more of an obstacle because well okay through through much of human history the miracles of the bible were seen by people inside and outside christianity as proofs of its claims one thing that happens in the enlightenment is that this gets reversed and now these seems now these kinds of things seem like reasons to to doubt the claims and to be skeptical about them point 2 about the resurrection the resurrection is vindication of sacrificial love. Jesus' life and death reveals an astonishing and powerfully attractive sacrificial love. And whether or not people, whether or not people believe that Jesus was the Son of God or believe in his miracles, the power of Jesus' life continues to have power in our world today to people. 
And what aspect of his life has power? One of the aspects that has tremendous power is his sacrificial love, is his love to the outcast, is his love for the poor. And, and not just the things that he said, but the way he practiced it and the cost of the practice. And, and this is, it's not even often overlooked. It is, it is, it is what matters. And I've made this point before about my friend who, um, grew up as a, as a young black boy in, in, in in Watts in LA and how his his undying gratitude for his mother was because of the sacrifices she made so that he could have a shot at life. In many ways, it was her sacrifice that redeemed him and you know his sons and their future. They're tremendously successful people in North America. They're far wealthier than I am, and they'll be they'll be far wealthier than I will ever be, if that's your measure of success. But the sacrifice of their mother bought that redemption, and and so what we see Jesus practicing again and again is is what I like to clarify as your well-being at my expense. That's how he lived. That's the relational polarity of the Christian life. And you see Jesus talk about it. Turn the other cheek. Sell all you have and give to the poor. All this radical self-giving. Well, when we see this, we pause and we say, now, wait a minute. I also have responsibilities. And money is important for me bearing my responsibilities to my family. And, and what often comes up is, is turning the other cheek responsible? And it's a fair question. And and where where we usually go with it is, where I find often secular people go with it, is they'll say, well, yeah, turning the other cheek is a nice symbolic way of, of embodying this. Or turning the other cheek can be an expedient strategy for winning over your neighbor. But to the degree that it's an expedient strategy, its sacrificial nature gets undermined. And, and so we wrestle with this idea of the vindication of sacrificial love. We look at Jesus' life because Jesus, in a sense, when he, in, when he admonishes his disciples to take up their cross and follow him, this, this was very much not merely symbolic, that the symbolism had power because the symbolism connected to the Roman reality that, yeah, I'll they would suffer on crosses. And, and in fact, when, when the mother of James and John comes and says, I want my boys to have the top spots, Jesus says, well, you know what gets the top spots? It's the sacrifice. It's the cup of suffering. And, and so right here, it's, it's no stranger why Peter, strange, it's no, it's no strange thing why Peterson finds meaning and suffering together because Jesus says they're completely connected. Value in this world is bought by suffering. Love in this world is seen by suffering. Meaning in this world is found in suffering. Suffering is the key to understanding, in fact, the meaning of suffering and the purpose of suffering and the value of suffering and the value of suffering, not just for this age, but the, the work it will produce in the next. The Apostle Paul writes about this. Dostoevsky writes about this very powerfully. This is, this is central to the Christian faith. Suffering isn't simply avoided. Suffering is becomes meaningful and purposeful in the pursuit of greater glory. And every single movie we watch that's a good movie at all has this. The hero's journey has this. It's the suffering of the hero that gives the glory to the outcome. This is the way this works. And this is, this was, this was not seen before Christ. This is again, one of these instances of what Christianity offered to the world that at this point is so deeply embedded within our culture. Now, the resurrection declares that this giving is not in vain, that this giving is rewarded, that this giving is productive. We might look and say, you know, we, people shouldn't love too sacrificially because you only live once because you have to get all the happiness you can because you deserve to be happy because if you don't get it now, you'll never get it at all. That's what secularity tells us. And so what it, what it invites us into is to be expedient and not meaningful. What it invites us into is to do what's good for me now. 
And what Jesus' sacrificial love does is reverse this. And one of the passages of the Bible where this is most beautifully articulated is the Christ song of 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 Philippians 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now again, if you if you reduce Jesus' incarnation to mere symbol, if you say, now he's a guy just like every one of us, there's no pre-existent Christ, there's no incarnation of a member of the Trinity into human flesh, well, you basically take away the power of this um, kenosis, of this, of this emptying of himself to become part of us. You take away the power of the love and you take away the vindication and the justification of almost everything that is common and commonly good in our world. Now let's imagine someone saw my friend's mother sacrificing for her son and said, you know, you shouldn't have children because children, they cost you money, children age you, children ruin your body so you're less sexually attractive to the opposite sex. Children are a bad deal. Or let's imagine she said, wow, this child is costing me too much. I'm going to abandon this child. Well, where does that leave the child? The power of this is not merely in the symbolism. The power of it is in the embodiment. The power of that story is because this woman actually sacrificed herself and her life and her time for her son. And there was no guarantee that her son was going to make good use of it. I know many, many examples of mothers who sacrifice for their children, and their children are wastes. But here, here in this story, Christ comes and who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human, in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. See, there's the hero's journey. There's Now he's exalted to the highest place because of the sacrifice. And so what this does is not just give sacrifice meaning, it it expands exponentially the power of sacrifice, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you can see here how in, again, how all of it is brought together and none of it is excluded that in fact the exaltation of Christ does not put at risk the Trinity. Point three, <clears throat> reinstatement of our intended place in the created order. If you read Genesis 1, you find these dominion statements. You've been given dominion over the, over the birds of the sea or the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. These are dominion statements and, and people have taken the, have, have started looking at these as suspect. Oh, this is, this is human abuse of creation. Well, it, misunderstands the relationship between humanity and creation as set up in the first chapters of Genesis. These image-bearing statements are, are intended to communicate how we are to, in fact, relate to our sister nature. And again, C.S. Lewis talks very well in this in his book, Miracles. When we rebel against God, nature rebelled against us us and rebels against us. Our power is limited by sister nature, and this is the colonizing that I've spoken about in many of my videos with respect to us and nature. We can colonize nature, but nature can kill us. And so we're in this perpetual struggle with nature, back and forth, back and forth. And we use technology now to dominate nature. And as we're seeing in our modern age, we use technology to dominate nature. And soon we discover that our use of nature in this way, our colonizing of nature in this way, is in fact imperiling us because we are destroying nature upon which we 
are dependent. And this is the struggle that the Bible shows us as being placed in nature. When, when Brett Weinstein says our programming is that of assassin robots, I would flip that around and say, <clears throat> we were, we were made to be kings and queens over sister nature, but we have inst- but we have instead become tyrants. And it is our fallen, broken nature that is these assassin robots. And what the resurrection intends to do is reinstate us in our proper role. And again, I don't know if anybody articulates this as well as C.S. Lewis in, in many of his, in many of his works, because he, he has really a sense for our proper relationship with nature. Again, now C.S. Lewis in his book Miracles has the miracles of the new creation, and Jesus' miracles demonstrate lordship over creation and give samples of our kingship in the age to come. So when Jesus multiplies loaves and fishes, when Jesus turns water into wine, when Jesus walks on water, when Jesus stills a storm, when Jesus gives sight to the blind, Jesus is acting as master over nature and nature happily submits, happily and trustingly submits. And this is again where C.S. Lewis talks about the specific pleasure of the inferior. Um, my dog is a often a rebellious dog, but when properly trained, my dog finds joy in pleasing. Look at a look at service animals. Service animals find joy in pleasing. And there's always that dynamic because we've not yet our relationship with nature has not yet been set right. But we can see glimpses of it. The child is pleased to satisfy the parent. The lover is pleased to satisfy the beloved. We, we, we play these roles, and, and this is what, in fact, the resurrection is intended to embody. Now, again, you might say, well, well, these are wonderful symbols, but would you be satisfied with a mere symbol? Don't you want to see it happen? You have an imagination of the marriage you want. You have the imagination of the relationship you you want with your dog or with your cat. You have the imagination of this, but isn't it better to have that actually embodied? Isn't the embodiment of it more powerful, more real, more critical? Now, you might say, well, yeah, but we can't have that. Well, all you're telling me is that you don't believe. You lack imagination. You're skeptical. That's that's all you're telling me when you're telling me that. Um, in our rebellion, we can't be trusted with this sort of power. We just can't. And, and our use of technology demonstrates that. Even the, the limited lordship we have over nature, the limited colonization we have over nature that we express through technology, look at what we do with it. We can't be trusted with the kind of, with the kind of colonization or mastery over nature that the brain has over my hand. My hand submits happily to my mind. It is not in rebellion. What if nature were in that kind of, oh, now the dog is at the cat. What if, what if, what if we had that kind of mastery over nature? We, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, that superhero movies are made of because given that kind of authority, what do we employ it to? We employ it to our egotism and our selfishness and our pettiness and our small mindedness. Our perfection, um, in our perfection, we will be, wor- we will be trustworthy. Now, again, you might say, well, these are just symbols and illustrations. Well, they are symbols and illustrations, but they're not just symbols and illustrations. They're signs and seals. And what the resurrection is, is the first fruits of the age to come. It's the beginning. And the rebel wisdom guys heard and heard from Pajot that, that Pajot made the point and exactly right that the resurrection begins. And T. Wright walk speaks well about this. And, and T. Wright's got a number of books on the resurrection. The resurrection begins with Jesus. In fact, that's the revelation of the resurrection. But the revel- the the resurrection is ongoing. It's moving slowly through the world right now, and it will come to full flourishing in the last day. That's the way the, the Bible talks about it. And And this is, again, what Christians believe. And if you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, exactly. You don't believe that. 
I do. I don't believe it as much as I should. I don't believe it in the way that I should. I would be happier, more joyful, more self-sacrificial if I believed in it more. And I'll talk about that towards the end of the video. But here's the question. Would you rather dream of flying like Iron Man or fly like Iron Man? In in eighteen in 1849, I'm pretty sure people dreamed of making it from New York City to San Francisco in a few hours, and they couldn't imagine how it would be done. Now, if someone actually showed up in San Francisco and said for dinner and said, "I ate breakfast in New York," would anyone believe him? No. Does that mean it's impossible? Does that mean it can't happen? Does it mean it can't happen in the future? Well, it happens commonly now. It happens via technology, but technology has its downsides. So we're pumping massive amounts of carbon into the air so that we can breakfast in New York and supper in San Francisco. Well, do you still not believe in the resurrection? Well, I just can't imagine it. Well, in, in 1849, they couldn't imagine someone having breakfast in New York and someone having dinner in San Francisco. Does that mean it can't happen? Does that mean it wouldn't happen? No, obviously not. This is why the humanity of Jesus is crucial for the story. The humanity of Jesus is crucial because Jesus basically says, if you live like me, you will die like me, and you will be raised like me. Now, if you live like Jesus, well, we all look at that kind of, we think about that in an imaginary way and think, yeah, that'd be so nice to live like Jesus. In our self-serving bias, we imagine we live like Jesus. But if you actually live like Jesus, it's costly. And when Jesus says, if you live like me, you'll die like me, he means what he says, because you will be hated by other people. Why? Because you break out of all the tribal games, and you and you show respect, and you love, and you sacrifice for people that the world says you shouldn't love or sacrifice. They deserve to be hated and reviled. And that's exactly what Jesus got in trouble for. Jesus was in trouble because he wasn't sufficiently deferential to the Romans, and he wasn't sufficiently tribal to his to the Jewish revolutionaries that were trying to kick off the Romans. All sides hated Jesus. Why? Because he wouldn't jump to their tune. And again, read the Gospels. It's all in there. But now here's the question. You think, well, yeah, I live like Jesus. Yeah, but do you really? Because to live like Jesus means not just to think I'm living like Jesus, not to imagine I'm living like Jesus, not to put crosses around my neck or put crosses in my house or to say I'm a Christian or do it means to actually live like Jesus. And when we see people doing that, it's powerful. It's in fact enormously powerful so that people stop and begin to say, huh, maybe the words are true because of what I see them live in their life. And again, that's the dynamic. The words are validated and vindicated by the action. It's the action that is the most real level. And so when someone says, well, says, well, I live sacrificially. What if they, in fact, do live sacrificially? It is not just, imagine, again, my friend who grew up in, in, in L.A. Imagine my friend, all his mother said to him was, I sacrifice for you. I sacrifice for you. But the child knows that the mother is selfish that the mother doesn't sacrifice, that the money, the mother just says she sacrifices but doesn't actually sacrifice. Will the son have any respect for the mother? Will the son have any gratitude for the mother? No, hardly. In fact, all the cheap talk, and this is a big problem with the church now, all of the cheap talk is wasted. It's sacrifice that matters. It's embodied. It's real. It's the cost of your life day by day. And I see this with people who, well, okay, Iceland has almost, Iceland has eradicated Down syndrome children. Is that a good thing? They didn't cure Down syndrome. They're all aborted. I look at, I interviewed my friend John Van Sloten, and you can go find my interview with him. And, you know, John and his wife raised their, or continue to care for their Down syndrome child. And I often see people with disabled children, and they sacrifice their lives for these children. These children live at the expense of the parents. And, and, and the, the disabled children often can't appreciate the cost that the parents are are shouldering 
for their disabled children. And it's a testimony to our society. And Canada is so, does so better than the United States, helping, helping my friend with the cost of taking care of his son, Edward. But that sacrifice has power because it's flesh and it's time and it's our lives. And this is the story. And we all get this. Now, again, to say, well, the, the resurrection is a nice symbol. Yeah, but I'll tell you what's far more powerful than a symbol. It's the reality. And again, you say, well, I can't believe that reality. And that's exactly right. You can't believe that reality. That's the point. Now, in my last video, I mentioned John Locke and justified belief. And again, this evidentialism is just this. That's evidentialism. You say, well, it's immoral to believe in the resurrection. I don't see any transgression of the moral law daring to believe in the resurrection. That's not the difficulty of it. The difficulty is actually believing it. That's the hard part. Might Christians be wrong? Sure. But show me the damage. If Christians want to display the cruciform love of Jesus for the well-being of their neighbors, will you object? Do you object that people who have people who have disabled children pour themselves out for their children? Do you object that? Now can this can this be done in an unhealthy way? Yes. Have I seen have I seen have I seen it been unhealthy? Yes. And often, especially with aging people, I've got a lot of older members in my church, I will warn the spouses who who love their partners to put limits on the self-sacrifice that they do for their partner, because if the caregiver goes down, their partner will suffer. And I've seen that again and again and again. So I'm not I'm not Pollyannish in this. I understand the complexities and the realities of it, but that doesn't take away from the centrality of, of this truth that sacrifice is what matters. If Christians want to display the cruciform love of Jesus for the well-being of their neighbors, will you object? No, in fact, you want your neighbors to be like this. You want your neighbors to be generous. You want your neighbors to be self-giving. You want your neighbors to be Christians. Why? Well, if they're this kind of Christian, if they're the kind of Christian that is that is willing to forgive, that is willing to sacrifice. You want to marry a Christian. Well, why do you want to marry a Christian? You want to marry a Christian who's going to give their life for you. Everyone loves that. The beauty is that if you're both Christians and you give your life for each other. Now, again, I don't want to get too Pollyannish with this because when it comes to working this out in reality, in terms of daily decisions, in terms of physicality, it's just terribly difficult and none of us are very good at it. And it has to be worked out because Jesus gave his life when Jesus chose to give his life. They tried to take his life a few times and he said, it's not my time. And so Jesus, in fact, had lordship and authority over that. He took it up and he laid it down and he chose when to lay it down. Lay it down. This does not in any way diminish our freedom. It actually expands our freedom because it's not simply freedom from, it's freedom to. And that's when we're going to get into a little bit more in religion. Okay. Point four, the death of death and the age of decay. In the age of decay, all loves are severed by death and betrayal. That's just true. Is this the world you want? This is the world you have. Is this the world you want? Is this, are you going to resign yourself to this world? Most people do. And again, I would assert that's a failure of imagination and it's a failure of belief. And what I will assert is that the Christian religion pushes against that and says no. Death does not always win. All individual and cultural accomplishments are hobbled by death. Petty selfishness and egotism. Think for a moment of, well, often people don't realize the heights of their accomplishment till they get later in life, in their 50s and 60s. And they've lived long enough. They've grown in wisdom. They've grown in maturity. They've read enough books. They've done enough learning. You know, look at Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson, yeah, he was born smart, but he made good use of his life to develop his intelligence and to get an education and so on and so forth. All of this will be taken from us at some point. He will die. And whereas we'll have his books and we'll have his videos, but he'll be gone and he will be missed. And we think about this, just, just, just go through the list of of brilliant contributors to human culture and how death 
takes them all from us. Now, that creates more space for new ones. That's a good thing. But we're living in limited time and limited space. What if death didn't take it? If you build a great business, decay will destroy it. If you build a great marriage, it will be destroyed by death or decay. Everything we build, moth and rust consume. That is the age of decay. Think about the toll that this takes on human culture. It's amazing that humanity has done as well as it has, quite frankly, because when you think about our capacity for pettiness and our capacity for everything, time, death, corruption robs us of everything. What does the resurrection do? The resurrection says, this will end. Now, again, is it just a symbol that this will end? Is it a symbol that, well, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice thought that this will end. But what does the secular conception of the secular cosmology say? It says, it will end. Nobody's denying that. And again, I've made this point before. You watch the, watch Neil deGrasse Tyson and ask him, will the sun run out of fuel? Yes, the sun will run out of fuel. That's the bad news. The good news is you'll die sooner. Oh, that's the good news? This is the way of the world. No one can deny this. The resurrection says this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of your story. This is not the end of the world's story. I think about the fact that countless millions of people have died short, painful, frustrating deaths, and they've taken with them all of their potential. Many cultures in the world have developed food, music, patterns of human interaction, relationships. So much of this is gone. The, 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 the fragments we have from history suggest to us that even in our rebellious state, human beings take the glory of the world and I'll talk about this in my next point and and perfect it and bring it to completion but now how much of that is lost by death and decay now Abraham Kuyper who was a Dutch polymath was prime minister was a theologian Abraham Kuyper says there's not one square inch in this world, and I would argue there's not one square inch of human history that Jesus doesn't cry, it is mine. Okay, what does that mean? In the resurrection, Isaiah 60, I've spoken about this before, in the resurrection, the ships from Tarshish come, bearing the glory that God seated in this world, and even his rebellious children produced what the resurrection says is that God will optimize and bring forward all that he, all that, all that can be, all that can be redeemed. Let's say it that way. What would you take for humanity? What would it take for humanity to arise to its full potential? Well, we'd have to stop dying for one thing, but, but the physical death is only the beginning. Because what do we do with our life? I mean, that's a mess. We need a new, more generous heart. And, and we all know how we should be. We should be able to forgive. We should be able to do justice. We should be able to love kindness and mercy. We, we should be able to do this, but we can't. We're petty. We're self-interested. We're a mess. We need to not have death rob us of the accumulated wisdom and knowledge of the individual. Decay needs to end. Death needs to stop. That's part of what the resurrection does. I, I left a note on the Rebel Wisdom, on the Rebel Wisdom video where I imagined someone, maybe they get to my age and they discover that, oh, they get to my age and they discover that the piano is a beautiful instrument and they, and they start taking piano lessons at, at the age of 50. Well, how good are they going to get? Because you know, if you really want to start learning the piano, you should learn as a child. Get that baked into your head. But the 50-year-old, maybe they didn't have a piano growing up. Maybe their parents didn't believe in music. Maybe their parents were too poor. And they can sit and they can listen to the recordings of the best piano music available in the world. The best piano music that's been written. And what they dream is the free not the freedom from, but the freedom to. The freedom to play that piano. The freedom to 
master that musical instrument, but they know they'll never have enough time because they're going to die. And they'll never have enough time because they've got a day job and they've got children to take care of and they've got to save for retirement. They've got to be responsible and they've got a house to maintain and et cetera, et cetera. They'll never have enough time to learn to play the piano the way they dream of. What does the resurrection say? Time will not be a problem. Death will not be a problem. And in fact, all of the pettiness will not be a problem. Not only will you find, <laughs> here's the thing, the best piano music has not yet been written. Well, what I mean by that? Well, because all of the people writing piano music were hobbled by the same things that hobble you, and they still manage to do some glorious things. Well, what does that mean? That means in the resurrection, you'll have time. You'll have access. Right now, we have these hierarchies, and so everyone wants to meet Jordan Peterson and shake the, shake his hand and, and tell them his story and, and share a little bit there of their life with him and say thank you to him. Well, why can't you do that? Time and space. He's got limited time. How much time can he spend listening to the, the thousands of people who have listened to his videos and want to thank him? Well, what about in the age to come? What about what if there's no death? What if you'd have the time to sit down and have a leisurely conversation with Jordan Peterson? Doesn't that sound great? What about sitting down and having a leisurely conversation with Jordan Peterson and C.S. Lewis? How does that sound? How about having sitting down and having a leisurely conversation with Jordan Peterson, C.S. Lewis, and St. Augustine, and Jesus, and the Apostle Paul, and Peter, and, 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 well, you start to think about this, and your mind starts to go in here. It's, this is this is glorious. This is thrilling. You, you think, well, yeah, that'd be amazing. Okay, dare you believe it? Dare you dream of it? Dare you imagine that it could happen? Okay, I'll, I'll enjoy the imagination of it, but how much more wouldn't you enjoy the actuality of it? And that's what the resurrection speaks of. That's what the resurrection promises. He said, well, I can't believe it. There we are again. We're back to the same point. That's right. You can't believe it. Time and accomplishment. What if you had unlimited time, time to converse with un unhurried individuals, time to develop skills and talents, time to enjoy the glory built into nature, time to study, time to learn, time to write, time to perfect, time to explore, time to live in the renewed creation. How would creation sing? Now what we have here is the loss of small imaginations. The images of the new creation are designed to be evocative. They're not exhaustive. We don't really know what our new capacities might be. We have no idea. Even our imaginatively extrapolating, even just imaginatively extrapolating beyond the capacities, we know the possibilities are breathtaking. And to think about this and to believe this and to imagine this well even just sitting here and thinking about it is terrific fun for me even speaking about it gets me excited because just the taste of it just the barest taste of it in my imagination living in the midst of this age and age of decay even this is thrilling me how much more wouldn't the thrill of it of the actuality of it be and and now, let's imagine, let's say, I'm imagining it now. I'm enjoying the vision of it. I'm enjoying the imagination of it. And then to come along and say, ah, sorry, you're not allowed to. What do you mean I'm not allowed to? You're, you're going to tell me that, that this somehow is a thought crime? That, that I ought not to indulge the imagination of it? That I ought not to cultivate my belief in it? That I ought not to live my life believing that all of the mundane sacrifices I have to make, that you have to make for the hours I need to spend sleeping, the hours I spend eating, the hours I spend working, the, the rent, the paying the rent kinds of things I have to do in life, the fact that now in my mid-50s I'll, I'll not, you know, according to the standards of this world, have the body I enjoyed as a 20-year-old but failed to appreciate. I'll, I'll not 
I'll not know the joys of being able to run my fingers through my hair again or the joys of having my wife run her fingers through my hair. On and on and on and on. You're going to somehow shame me or guilt me into not even merely imagining or believing this? I'm, I'm, I, I deny that. I think that's, I think that's silly. I think that's petty. I think it's small mindedness. I, in fact, am going to continue to do this. I am going to enjoy it. In fact, I'm going deeper into the belief of it and I'm anticipating it to come. Now you might say, well, is that selfish? Well, imagining it isn't selfish, especially when the imagination of it leads me to actually spend my life doing what? Loving sacrificially. You see, the thing is, if, if, which is, which is more selfish to say, well, I can't believe I'm going to have all of these things in the age to come. So I am going to, um, deprive my children and deprive my wife. And I'm going to go, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'm going to divorce my wife and find some 20 something woman to regain my youth with. And, and buy a red sports car and have a midlife crisis. And, and I'm going to live utterly selfishly because my life is coming to an end. I need to grab all that I can right now and secure it because that's what the other way does. What I'm doing is saying, I'm going to believe in the resurrection. I'm going to believe that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to get to see this whole world. I might not even get to see much of it. And in fact, when I go, because of my age now and because I'm getting older, I'm going to enjoy it less and less. But in the renewed creation of our Lord, it's suffering in this world, as one great saint said, is merely a night in an inconvenient motel, that I have all this to look forward to. And it gives me joy now in my heart, and the anticipation of its reality in the flesh gives me joy. And this is what the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ means. Point five, the full fruit of glory. The creation was made for glory. Glory is an unselfish thing. This is why God is so humble not to distract us from his handiwork. I, I often tell a story when I, I teach a class because I'll ask people, what was, what, what's the meaning of existence? Oh, I don't know. It's glory. Well, what do you mean by that? It's, it's glory. The, the, the glory of the baker is the cake. The glory of the musician is the music. The glory of the creator is the creation. Now, now the creator is always greater than the creation, but this is what he's doing. The color purple, um, as this, the movie, the color purple has this great scene where, um, where the two women are walking through a field and, and one is saying, I think it just ticks God off when we walk past the color purple and don't notice it. And the other woman says, are you saying God is vain? And she says, no, he's just trying to share a good thing. And so he shares himself through these good things. He shares himself through these glory. You'll notice the pictures of Yosemite on, on a lot of the things that I do. I love going to Yosemite because when I go into Yosemite Valley, I see God's glory. They say, wow, that was carved out by glaciers. Sure. But. The artist, you know, Jonathan Peugeot, carves out wood with chisels. Are you saying it isn't glorious because he uses chisels? That's just silly. This is why God is so humble not to distract us from his handiwork. This, in fact, magnifies his glory further. The baker who bakes a great cake, who keeps drawing attention to herself instead of the cake, undermines the glory. The musician who keeps drawing attention to herself instead of the music she makes undermines the glory this is what this is how glory works and we are made as sub creators to take the raw material of glory and make it still more glorious we perfect grapes and make wine but can we handle the alcohol we perfect wheat and bake cakes but can we handle the sugar we take air vibration and make music. We take physics and make technology. This is, this is what we're made for. This is glorious. And I cannot wait until we are unhampered by time and decay 
to take the, the, the potential of God's glorious creation. This is, in a sense, what Tolkien talked about in terms of the elves. Now, the elves had their issues, but the, the technology of the elves seemed to perfect creation without dominating it, which was what the te technology of Sauron did. This is what we're made for. We're sub-creators, and God seeds this in us, and it's natural to us. And we're rebels, but we don't undo the created good. Well, it's hampered. It's, it's hard to talk about this stuff. But we're rebels, and so we take the created goodness, and we abuse it and maluse it and use it against each other. But the power is still within us. So as I said many times in this video, the question is not should, but how. Should we not believe this stuff? No, you should believe this stuff. You'd be crazy not to believe this stuff. This stuff can fill you with joy. This stuff can make your life the kind of life that everybody respects and admires. This this life, this this kind of vision can make you unselfish. This kind of vision can make you generous. This kind of vision, in fact, undoes the pettiness that secularity brings us to where we imagine we've got to grab it all now. This kind of vision makes us the best kind of human beings, and in fact, the best kind of human beings that everyone admits are the best kind of human beings. Believing in the resurrection, believing in the physicality of the resurrection spurs us to do, to love our neighbor sacrificially. It's deeply connected. So the question isn't should, but how can we? Because we don't believe in it enough. We believe in community, and secular skepticism encourages doubt. Now, when I say we believe in community, to say I think for myself isn't really true. I think with other people. That's how we're made to think. We believe our beliefs are always between us, and we influence each other, and we pick up beliefs from other people, and it's, it's very difficult to resist the beliefs of other people. That's why religion is so often passed down in families. Now, it's very complicated, and there's ins and outs of it, but, but this is the reality of us. So we believe in community. But secular skepticism encourages doubt. You need to be immersed in a sense-making structure. There's a word from Eric Weinstein in his intellectual dark web. You need to be immersed in a sense-making structure. And when you look at, obviously, there's big conversation between Protestants and Orthodox about imagery. But if you look at what Jonathan Pajot and the Orthodox are doing with imagery... They are creating a visual universe around them as a sense-making structure. That's why they build the churches they build and so on and so forth. And they have architecture and embodiment. I'm not going to get into the Protestant um, iconoclastic debates. But the church is a sense-making structure that encourages the belief that delivers the joyful motivation of costly sacrificial love. That's why you believe in the resurrection. That's why you should want to believe in the reality of the resurrection and as the, and the resurrection as the central reality of being more real than the swords of Caesar, of being more real than Pilate's cross, the resurrection of being more real than the walls and the locked door of the disciples' room so that Jesus comes into the room with the door locked and isn't a ghost, not being less real than the walls, but being more real and eats a fish. See, he colonizes the fish. How can you see this? Uh, nobody's going to say Nicholas Kristoff. Oh, here comes the cat. Here we go. Nobody's going to say that Nicholas Kristoff, no, you find Nicholas Kristoff talking to Tim Keller. You can find that on YouTube. Nicholas Kristoff is a left-leaning New York Times writing opinion piece. Well, when he went to Africa, what did he discover? You know, we have all these debates about American health care. You know health care for a lot of Africa? Christian missionaries, Christian doctors, and these Christian doctors that have, you know, they could be earning great salaries in North America. They go to Africa to do what? To serve the people that this world does not value. And we look at that. And we admire that. 
and we esteem that. And you don't have to be a Christian to esteem that. You just admire it. It's built into us from below. And as the title of this opinion piece, Nicholas Kristof has written quite a few pieces on this because he, he can't get over it. He keeps looking at it. He keeps drawing his attention. Why should these people sacrifice their lives for these people that don't matter to the world? Ah, now you're seeing the revelation of Jesus. Well, my guess is that the majority of these doctors believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus, that the more majority of these doctors are saying, I'm going to live, I'm going to give my life now, but I'm more than going to receive in the age to come. Do you find that offensive? Do you find that irresponsible? Do you want the doctors to stop? Do you want them to say, Psh, what am I doing helping these Africans? I'm going to go back to North America, and I'm going to get a job in a hospital, and I'm going to get a big car, and I'm going to have a good salary. I'm not saying anything against the doctors in North America who are serving. It's the witness of these doctors in Africa that is startling. Jordan Peterson belief says we need to believe to endure suffering. Yes, carrying that heavy cross can give you the feeling of meaning was it, is it only a feeling or is it something real? And I think this is deep within what Peterson is scratching at and exploring that. This is, this is built into us. This isn't just ideas produced by the gray matter in our brains. Meaning isn't something that we simply project onto the world as a function because of our emotional needs. This, in fact, is built into us from below. And to be embodied is more real than imagined or merely felt. See, suffering is a feeling too, and you know this is, in a sense, what the what the Buddhist what the Buddhist approach to suffering says. Well, it's suffering is a feeling, and it's a feeling I have. If I can get rid of me, then I can stop suffering. Christianity takes suffering from the other way around, and you can find Peter Kreef's um, "The Dark Side," which is an essay he wrote for Socrates in the City for Eric Metaxas. You Google that, you can find it. Hope motivates to embody action. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If I can say, okay, I don't feel like helping my neighbor. I don't feel like enduring the sacrifice of, of doing what my neighbor needs instead of what I want right now. The hope of glory can motivate me to sacrifice and to, and to in fact, help and love my neighbor. It motivates those doctors to go to Africa. And many of those doctors will will say, yeah, but it's our joy, it's our glory, because there's that dynamic in there too. Now again, you might say, well, I can't believe that. You're right, you can't. Uh, Dallas Willard and John Ortberg both write some really good stuff on training versus trying. You might say, I want to believe that, but I can't. That's right. Just like you might want to play the piano like a master, but you can't. What does it take to learn to play the piano? It takes practice. It takes investment. It takes discipline. It takes accountability. And if you haven't invested or committed your time to shape your belief and behaviors. Now, some of us were fortunate in that my parents raised me in this before I was able to make my own selfish choices. Oh, now the dog's going after the cat. Dogs and cats. You haven't invested, my parents invested in, invested in this, in this, in me without my consent. And I'm grateful they have. Um, you haven't invested or committed to the time to shape your belief and behavior. Sometimes you need to do first in order to believe second. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that you have to practice it just like you have to practice the piano and you have to usually you have to first want it and then you'll have to do it and then doing once you get the sense of playing the piano you get the the greater sense of of wanting to play the piano better and so it's something that you live in and it's something that you embody and it's something that you pursue in that way it needs to be disciplined and accountable um, or it won't yield the intended fruit again you might say well I I want to believe it. Okay, well, then you're going to have to take disciplined steps and create a plan to train in order to believe it. Well, what do you need? 
But you need a community of support. We know this from addiction work. You need a community of people that are going to encourage you because our feelings are fickle. Sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we 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 lose the path. And, and so a community of support comes around and says, I'm going to encourage you. Let's move forward. Let's do better. A community that embodies the ideal and practices the too large in a small way. I mean, the too large is obviously what I've what I've said about the resurrection here is huge. Well, it's too large, and and C.S. Lewis gets this in in terms of his this story, the Great Divorce, that 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 hell is actually a really tiny little thing, and the new creation is huge. Well, this world is a little tiny thing, and the new creation is huge. And so what in imperfect and striving ways we try to embody this in the church, and that's what the church is for. A community that strives to model it, leadership that maintains the dream and encourages the people to move forward. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in, because the Holy Spirit creates the church and gives us the power to do the hard work of forgiving our neighbor, of enduring, of continuing on, of of daring to believe what this world tells us we ought not to believe. I'll give you an illustration, the challenge of marriage. What is marriage for? Well, some people say marriage is for happiness, or marriage is for safe sex, or marriage is for heirs. Well, um, what is marriage for? Read Tim Keller's book on marriage. Marriage is to make you less petty and selfish. Marriage is to refine you and make you the kind of person you can be. Well, what does that involve? It involves suffering. You're, you, One of the things that I noticed as a, I didn't realize how selfish, selfish I was until I was married. And then I didn't realize how selfish I was until I had children. And I didn't realize how selfish I was until I had more children. And being a father and being a husband is just one long humiliating streak of learning how petty and selfish I really am. Because left to my own devices, I sit here with all my own biases and imagine that, oh, I'm giving and I'm loving and I'm self-sacrificial, but the truth is I'm not. The church does the same thing. The institution doesn't ensure the outcome, but without the institution, you'll likely never achieve the outcome. You need to endure to learn to endure. You need to practice every day. And anyone who is successful at marriage will tell you what it costs. It costs your ego. It costs your pride. Is it worth it? Ask married people. Ask people who've been successful at it. And, and, and many aren't. There's no guarantee that marriage will be successful. But like I said, the institution doesn't ensure the outcome. But without the institution, you'll never achieve the outcome. Well, well, the church is like that. Ideally, the church is the community where the resurrection is practiced, where it's embodied. And, and the list I gave you this morning is just a small one. It, it's, it's more than, um, it's more than us, like marriage is more than us. No one, no one is up to the task of marriage. Um, you will all fail it. And all churches are failures. We're just not up to the task. Um, and the belief, um, the belief that you can maintain alone, that you can maintain this image of the resurrection alone is thin, malnourished, and shallowy idealistic. The belief you grow is embodied and robust. And, and that's how life works. You, you, you believe it. You practice it. You grow it. It's, it's, it's beyond us. And this, again, is why the physical nature of the resurrection is so important in terms of understanding how this whole thing fits together and how reality is construed and constructed. Now, you might say the perfect church. Now, I've gotten a fair amount of questions about church, and churches are imperfect. I am not saying if you have a deeply flawed or abusive church that you must stick with it. I am not saying that. I'm not saying if you have an abusive partner, you should stick with your marriage. I'm not saying that. There are good reasons to leave a church. There are good reasons to leave a marriage. What I am saying is you will not find the perfect church. You will not find the perfect pastor. You can learn from, you can learn more from an imperfect church than a better one often because, and it's the same thing with marriage. Um, it's, it's the people who struggle with marriage that know its difficulties and know its complexities and can actually be experts in it. It's the people with, that wrestle with themselves that can actually give you wisdom. 
<coughs> the best spouse for you might not be the perfect spouse. It might be an imperfect spouse. And again, I'm not giving marriage advice or selection. I think you should probably marry the best person you can find because it'll still be hard. But that's, that's the way this stuff goes. The imperfect are the only ones available. And the perfect and the perfecting is the challenge. It's where you experience the meaning and it's the glory of the effort. So the resurrection. Do you still prefer it to be just a symbol or a metaphor of new beginnings or a bird in the hand already? I say, no, you should want the resurrection to be physical. You should want the resurrection to be more the most real thing that has happened in all of human history. The most real thing that continues to, to unfold and, and draw us into it until we are completely swallowed and taken by it. Don't you want to feel it, embody it, practice it, make it real in your life, even in the midst of the age of decay? You should. I recommend it. That's my video on the resurrection.